the art and science of mead all about finding agents Here's an overview of some of the topics that we'll discuss today. I'll talk about why use finding agents at all and how do they work, what types of finding agents we have available, and review some of the individual finding agents. I'll talk about problems when finding and how to avoid these problems or address them if they occur. And then finally, I'll talk about how to do bench trials, which are a very important tool to use in order to determine our dosage and which finding agent might be the most appropriate and effective for whatever problem we're trying to address. There's different ways to clarify mead, time and patience, careful racking. These can all help make your mead clear. I did not use finding agents for many years and not filtration either. However, even though you might have what you think is a very clear mead, it'll turn out it's never going to be quite as clear, especially if you're going to be using uh, filtration. But you can make many meads very clear through the use of time, racking and finding agents. So why clarify meat at all? Well, like I mentioned before, if you like what you're making, keep doing it. If you want to make something that's brilliant and beautiful to look at, then I recommend learning how to use finding agents and then maybe filtration as well. Even though you think your mead may be as clear as it possibly can be, often it may not be quite as clear as you think and appearance does matter, especially if you're planning on selling your mead or if you're planning on winning some medals and competitions. Also, finding agents can help stabilize your mead so that later on it doesn't form a sediment or, or light dust on the bottom of the bottle that you didn't expect because you thought your mead was already uh, clarified. So before I begin, please remember that any of the dose ranges that I mentioned in this presentation are suggestions rather than absolutes. Always refer to the manufacturer's recommendations for how to prepare and dose your finding agent. And also remember that in real life situations, the actual dose may vary by quite a bit. I believe that less can be more. If you can get away with using less or a lower amount of a finding agent, you're always better off. But there may be times when you need to use more or when you need to use counter finding with multiple agents. So when you're unsure, it's always best to use bench trials to determine what exactly is going to work. When we think about finding agents, most of us think about clarification and stability. And to be sure, that's probably the main reason why we use finding agents. But finding agents can have other benefits as well for much more than just clarifying your mead. Certain finding agents can decrease astringency and bitterness. They can improve mouthfeel and, re and reduce some off aromas. So think about finding agents not only for clarification, but for some other things as well to improve the character of your mead. Here's a chart of some of the different types of finding agents that you might choose depending on the problem. If you're thinking about protein stability, then you may choose bentonite. But if you've got problems with bitterness from some of the condensed tannins or phenols, you might think about PVPP. Whereas if you have astringency from tannins itself, you may think about gelatin. How do finding agents work? Well, they can work through electrostatic charge. The fighting agent and the substances to be removed are of opposite charges, and they basically uh, attract one another. Some fighting agents work through the formation of a chemical bond between the substance and the to be removed and the fighting agent, and others work through absorption and absorption. So electrostatic charge 
if you think about it, some of the suspended solids, such as proteins, have a charge. Some will be negatively charged and some will be positively charged. It's very important because you may choose one finding agent to start with that has a negative charge and then you may later on, if needed, use another finding agent that has the opposite charge. It might not make that much sense to use two finding agents that both have the same charge because you may not necessarily get the effect that you desire. Basically, the molecules are loose, but then they clump together when the finding agent and then they slowly settle out uh, and settle out and down to the bottom where they can where the meat can be racked off. Some examples of negatively charged finding agents are bentonite and silica gel. They tend to remove positively charged proteins, which cause protein haze. And then there's some positively charged finding agents, which will remove negatively charged particles such as yeast, tannins, and other particulate matter. And some examples of this are gelatin, isinglass, chitosan, sparkloid. There are also some neutral agents also, such as PVPP or uh, casein. Bond formation. Uh, this usually happens with tannins and proteins. And that's one reason why if you put meat into a barrel, it may suddenly, within a few days, clear. And that's because of the tannins that can be present from the barrel. And then there's absorption and absorption. Uh, this would be uh, in, in activated charcoal or carbon. It's not, it's not as, as specific as, as a finding agent that may uh, work through the electrostatic charge, but it can be useful in uh, certain specific situations uh, that where other finding agent may, agents may not have been successful. And basically, after you add the finding agent, it slowly uh, sediments to the bottom, and then you can rack or siphon your meat off of the sediment. What type of finding agents are there? Well, these are some of the types of finding agents available. Uh, some of them can be put probably into more than one category. I simply uh, organize them in this way so that it's a little bit easier to go through and explain. We have the earths, which is bentonite, protein-based agents such as gelatin, isinglass, chitosan, and some others. There's some of the gels and polymers such as silicosol or PVPP polysaccharides such as sparkaloid or gum arabic, and then some of the other agents that don't exactly fit into any of these other categories. Here's another chart looking or showing how some of these are negatively charged, positively charged, where they come from. I'm not going to read through this chart. You can have this. It'll be in, your, in the handouts. Bentonite. Bentonite's probably one of the most uh, common, commonly used finding agents by both uh, mead makers and wine makers. And it comes from a type of clay that's mined in Wyoming, Montana, and some other locations. It's negatively charged. It's uh, ideal for removal of proteins, but it's non-specific. Some finding agents work better at certain temperature ranges, and bentonite tends to work better at the upper end of its temperature range. It can be used both before or after fermentation. That's one place where it is unique in that it can be used before or during fermentation, whereas most of the other finding agents are used afterwards. It's very helpful for ensuring protein stability. What I mean by that is you may have what you think is a clear mead, and then months later you look at it and there's actually some sediment on the bottom of the bottle that wasn't there, and you're kind of surprised to see that. So bentonite is very helpful for, do, for that and also to prevent protein haze later. If it's used early in fermentation, it might provide nucleation sites for the yeast as they're fermenting, and it does not tend to remove tannins unlike some of the other finding agents. So here are some examples of where the uh, bentonite clay is mined. I'm from Wyoming, and I drive by this plant uh, in Upton, Wyoming, probably at least once a week, and every time I drive by, I wonder if ever over the many years that I've made mead and wine, have I ever gotten bentonite that was originally mined from this location? Obviously, there's no way to know, but it's kind of nice to think about, you know, maybe it's something that's locally produced to where I live. Well, no finding agent is without problems, and there can be issues with bentonite. Uh, one problem is the leaves can be bulky and easily disturbed. It can cause you to lose some of your product, which you might not want. Uh, one way that you can help prevent that is by counterfining with silica sole or with gelatin. If uh, bentonite is added before fermentation, remember it does remove nutrients, so there is a chance that it potentially could 
uh, lower the YAN, yeast assemblable nitrogen. So it's very important that we, as mead makers, perform stagger nutrient additions. My personal opinion is this probably isn't that, bit, that big of a deal in mead because we do add nutrients. I think it's more of a problem if you're making a grape wine and you're not adding any nutrients at all. It could potentially deplete the yan, the yeast assimilable nitrogen, and then cause some problems later, such as some off aromas uh, or a uh, stuck fermentation. I don't have any data to confirm that. This would actually be an interesting study for someone to do is to uh, add bentonite to a, a mead must and then measure the uh, yan both before and after the bentonite was added, including uh, what it was from your nutrient additions. There is potential for overfining. It's uh, not as big of a problem in bentonite as it is with some of the other fining agents, such as gelatin. Uh, it's more of a problem as well as other issues, such as imparting an earthy taste if you're using it post-fermentation. So you, therefore, you do need to be a little bit more careful if you're using it post-fermentation. Uh, it should not be disposed of down the drain. One of the purposes of bentonite clay is for waterproofing stock ponds uh, so that uh, if you put that clay down your septic tank and it goes into your leach field, uh, well, it's going to end up clogging your leach field. And as a home brewer, you might think, well, I'm not really using very much. But if you do it over and over again over years, it, it may cause problems. So it's probably best to just uh, toss out any of the leaves that have any bentonite outside in your compost pile or somewhere else where it won't cause any problems. And the, one of the other things is you should not use bentonite at the exact same time as you're adding pectic or other enzymes. Usually what I do is I add the pectic enzyme first, and then I'll add the bentonite later. And how long you need to wait has been debated. Uh, usually 24 hours should be enough. You might be able to add the bentonite even sooner than that. I've heard some people adding it as soon as 12 hours or even earlier. But myself, I usually wait about 24 hours before I add the bentonite after I've added pectic enzyme. And then bentonite depends on the pH being... Uh, within the proper range. And so if the pH is too high, the isoelectric point is not going to allow the bentonite to be quite as effective as it, as it would have been. There are two types of bentonite. Sodium bentonite, which has greater swelling power and uh, higher uh, fin protein finding capacity, but does add some sodium. Uh, one problem with sodium bentonite is that it does not... Uh, Form, it does not form leaves that are quite as compact as, as compared to uh, calcium bentonite. Calcium bentonite precipitates at a slower rate and does not have quite as great protein finding capacity, but it pr produces more compact leaves, so there's less waste or loss of your mead when you're racking it off of the leaves. There are some other types of bentonite also. There's KWK, agglomerated bentonite. Uh, the way that it's been prepared, it, all, it also results in more compact leaves. It does not take as long to hydrate as compared to standard bentonite, which you might purchase at your homebrew shop. There's two other ones to, uh, that I've used as well, Albumex and then Canaton. Uh, these dissolve instantly, so you can put them right into your batch if you want to. They don't require hydration, which I find can be sometimes quite annoying, uh, having to wait for your standard bentonite to hydrate. Uh, the Albumex and the Canaton have to be used at different pHs, however. So the dose varies. Typically, it's one to two grams per gallon. The range is quite large. Uh, you probably should be using a lower dose post-fermentation. Pre-fermentation, bentonite is a lot more forgiving, so you can you can use a, a, a dose that might be a little bit more than you would otherwise. And so to hydrate, uh, always read the manufacturer's directions. Some types don't require as much time as others, but when you're hydrating standard bentonite, usually we recommend making a 5% uh, slurry. So for every gram of bentonite, use 25 ml of water, and you let it stand for at least 24 to 40 hours. The KWK can be used in uh, one to two hours, and then the other ones, uh, the instantly dissolving products, the Albumix and Canadon, uh, they don't require uh, any time at all. So I usually stir it into the mead for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then after one or two weeks, I rack it off. Uh, stirring the mead after you've added the fining agent is very important because you want to allow the fining agent to come in contact with your entire mead. If you just pour it into the batch and walk away, a lot of times it'll just settle to the bottom and it won't get into as much contact with the mead and, and with whatever particles you're trying to precipitate out of that. So stirring uh, is important. You don't want to stir quite as much as if you are uh, trying to aerate or degas, obviously, but just some gentle stirring to make sure that it's mixed uh, is a good idea. 
So why is hydration important? I know a lot of mead makers simply just pour the powdered bentonite on top of the mead and, and just kind of let it go. Uh, bentonite is a dehydrated form of clay, and it's basically in these little cards. And as water is added, the cards begin separating. These little layers become, as it swells, they start coming apart, and they finally form uh, these little shapes that uh, that they've been described as a house of cards, as a bunch of cards uh, stacked together, and it gives it a lot more surface area, and that's why hydrating will allow you to have better protein binding capacity. Here are some electron micrographs showing a uh, non-hydrated bentonite, and then as it's coming apart after the water was added, and then slowly you can see these little layers and these nooks and crannies, which will allow the bentonite to be a lot more effective in uh, reducing protein haze. A lot more surface area for it to bind to whatever it is you're trying to uh, clarify out of that. But there are some of us that simply just put the bentonite into the uh, wine or meat itself. Uh, one of the benefits of that is it won't be quite as fluffy. You'll, you'll have a the, the leaves formation won't be as much, uh, which is eat much makes it much easier to rack off of the those leaves. You won't lose as much product, but as a downside, you won't be able to you won't bind protein as well either. So you could have some pro problems potentially with protein haze afterwards. There are some who hydrate in hot water, which has been adjusted uh, usually with citric acid to a pH of 3.0. Uh, this allows it to hydrate more quickly. It allows you to disperse it into the wine or mead but it also lowers the swelling capacity a little bit and might also lower protein binding. So these methods all work and it really depends on what you're trying to do. If, if you find a method or a technique that works for you, I recommend that, that you keep doing it. I, I myself, I like to hydrate, but I also like those instantly dissolving ones because they're a lot more easier. Hydration can sometimes be a pain in the neck having to wait uh, and it forms clumps and you're trying to stir those up and it can be kind of a pain in the neck to get those uh, all dissolved before you put it into your uh, mead. But these other techniques can be options also. Protein-based finding agents. This is a large group of different agents that we use. So the classic one is gelatin. It's made from animal collagen, usually skin or bones. It's positively charged. And one of the important things to keep in mind is it tends to work best in the presence of tannins. So it may not work as well in a traditional mead that may not have any tannins added, especially if that traditional mead was not aged in oak, does not have any tannin additions. Where a, a gelatin might, might work well would be something that does have naturally occurring tannins, for example, maybe a mellow mel or a piment, uh, or if you had tannin additions. Uh, the optimum temperature tends to be at the lower end of range. There's different types of gelatins, and they are described as having a, quote, bloom, Unquote, that's, and the greater the bloom, the greater the binding capacity. The gelatin tends to remove the higher molecular weight tannins, and so these are the ones that cause astringency rather than bitterness as you get with some of the smaller uh, phenolics. So the benefits of gelatin besides improving clarity is it can help reduce astringency. But it is one of the finding agents that has a higher risk of overfining. So you could remove color or tannins, or you could actually overfine and cause there to be a, a haze from the gelatin itself. It works well combined uh, with bentonite. So you uh, add the bentonite first, and you counterfine with gelatin. Uh, if you do add tannins, then you can add those first, and then you can add the gelatin afterwards. Uh, or uh, you can uh, use a silica sol to counterfine the gelatin, and that helps avoid overfining with gelatin. So the doses vary. If you're only going to use gelatin for clarification, you could use a very small amount. Uh, for bitterness, you might uh, use a higher amount. And if it's got very astringent, such as a red piment or something like that, you might use a higher dose still. And typically, I, I rack it off after about two or three weeks. There's liquid gelatin, which has a lower rate of precipitation, but it's much easier to prepare and to use. Uh, there's solid gelatin, which has to be prepared in warm water, and you have to let it sit for a few minutes and then stir it until the lumps are dissolved. Uh, don't boil it. Of course, that'll simply denature the protein in the gelatin, and uh, it, it's kind of like boiling a, an egg where the, the egg white basically is, you know, it's not, it's totally changed. So you don't want to overheat it. Just put it in warm water. And because there's a risk of overfining, I do recommend bench trials uh, with gelatin whenever possible. 
So isinglass, this comes from the fish bladders of sturgeon, but not only sturgeon, other fish. It's also positively charged uh, like gelatin, but unlike gelatin, it does not require the presence of tannins. It's not sensitive to temperatures, which means it can work fairly well at low temperatures as compared to some of the other finding agents. It has a lower risk of overfining compared to other agents such as gelatin. One of the benefits of isinglass is it can lend brilliance and it can also improve mouthfeel. It's a gentle finding agent compared to many of the other agents that we use. Well, uh, some of the issues that are undesirable, it might take a while and the leaves can be somewhat fluffy. Uh, it doesn't always clear completely and you have to be careful. Uh, it can clog filters. Uh, so you might use it uh, with uh, silica gel for faster settling, or you can use it uh, after bentonite to help compact the lees. And the dose varies. Uh, it's a fairly low dose. There is both liquid as well as isinglass powder. The isinglass powder does uh, require some preparation. In this situation, you want to dissolve it in cool water as compared to warm water, which you would have done with the gelatin. Uh, liquid isinglass is available through homebrew shops and I actually much prefer that. It's a lot easier to use so that I tend to use like liquid isinglass when I'm going to use it. And then you can rack it off after a couple of weeks. Kytosan. Uh, this is one of the agents that's in the commercially uh, available uh, two-step product called Super Clear. This is prepared from exoskeletons of small crustaceans. It's got a strong positive charge. It does not require tannins and it's relatively gentle and with a lower risk of overfining. It's commonly used in that commercial product super clear uh, in combination with silica sol or silica gel. One of the things that comes up uh, on forums or online is a question about chitosan and how safe is it for those with shellfish allergy. And you know, if you remember shellfish allergy, that's uh, those are, these are people that are severely allergic to uh, shellfish such as shrimp. And, and this can be serious. Uh, these people can have anaphylaxis and even require like epinephrine, like an EpiPen. Uh, a shellfish allergy can be life-threatening. So it's something that's understandable for people to be concerned about. But it turns out that the process for isolating the chitosan removes all of the anti, uh, all the allergenic uh, proteins. So basically it is not, does not have any risk of causing allergy. Uh, in P, even in people who are sensitive to have having uh, shellfish allergy or anaphylaxis. The FDA uh, considers it GRAS, generally recognized as safe. This is why commercial wineries do not need to list on the label if they've used chitosan. Uh, it's also used in hospitals, in bandages, and for wound management without any restrictions as to whether or not someone has shellfish allergy. And finally, there was a study by Amaral uh, et al., which show that wine that had uh, had been processed with chitosan does not cause any allergic reactions. They tested it basically in people who had severe shrimp allergy and they did not have any problems at all. So I know there's a lot of people online saying, oh no, you cannot use chitosan for people that have shellfish allergy, but that's actually a myth. That's not, not anything that's a, a problem or anything to worry about. Casein. So it's a protein found in milk and I have a photo of milk here because uh, some of the old-time winemakers actually would use milk itself as a finding agent. I don't recommend that, but potassium caseinate can be very helpful for certain specific situations. Uh, it precipitates very quickly in low pH, which can make it kind of a hassle to use, and so you have to know how to use it appropriately to put it into your meat or wine. And, and it's really used more for changing some of the off aromas or flavors that you don't want. So it's good for removing excess bitterness, tannins. If uh, there's some oxidation, it can help uh, remove some of those oxidized notes and bring out fresh character. If your meat or uh, wine is completely oxidized, of course, it's not going to completely fix that. But if it's only got some mild oxidation, it might help uh, help remove that. So as I mentioned, it's difficult to use because you have to prepare it in a high pH solution. But then as soon as it hits the low pH, it'll start uh, start solidifying. And so you have to add it very quickly. It's not really so much for clarification, and there is a chance of overfining, but as long as you use lower amounts, that's not so much of a problem. It can work really well with silica, silica gel. Uh, and often, if you have problems with excess bitterness or oxidation, uh, you can use the casein and PVPP combined together at, or add it at the same time. For removing browning or oxidation, you typically will use a lower amount, whereas if there's bitterness and excess tannins, you might use a higher amount. 
I always recommend using bench trials first to decide exactly how much you want to add. To prepare it, you dissolve it in a high pH solution. Uh, alkalinizing the water with potassium bicarbonate can help it dissolve, and you need to let it sit for a, a few hours. But in order to get it into the meat, if you simply poured it in there and started stirring, it would start precipitating immediately. So one of the easiest ways to use casein as a home brewer is to get your, your turkey baster uh, that you might be using as a wine thief, suck up some of the casein um, out of your wherever, whatever vessel you did to prepare it, and then inject it forcefully into your mead and do that and, and then stir it up. So that way it gets uh, dispersed throughout the mead almost immediately. Uh, usually you can leave it up to two weeks at most, although usually after a week it's done its job and uh, you can rack it off of that after that. Egg whites. I, I put the some slides in about this, it, almost more out of historical interest. It's not something that you would generally use very commonly in mead. Uh, it's typically used more in uh, red wine, but it certainly could be used uh, in a red pie mint or melomel. It tends to be gentle and it removes some of the astringency from excess tannins. Uh, usually it's about one egg white for every five or six uh, gallons. The way that it's prepared is you whip it into a froth with a pinch of salt and some, and, and remove any foam, and then you can put it into your uh, right into the um, into the batch of mead or even uh, into the barrel, and then you should rack it off. So synthetic gel and polymers. Silica gel or kiesel sol is one of the combinations that's in uh, the two-step product available uh, for home brewers called Super Clear. Uh, one of the things about it is it is the other agent besides bentonite that has a negative charge. So that's very important to keep in mind. If you used a uh, positively charged finding agent and it did not fully uh, achieve what you wanted, you might consider using a negatively charged finding agent such as uh, silica sol or bentonite. It does not require the presence of tannins, and it has a low risk of overfining, which is one another reason why I like it. Uh, it's used for general clarification and protein stability, and it does not have much risk of affecting flavor and aroma, unlike some of the other agents. It can be good for compacting bent night leaves, and it's often used in combination with chitosan as super clear, or you can use it in combination with gelatin as well. PVPP, polyvinyl polypyrrolidone. It's a synthetic polymer, and it's used uh, for removing uh, tannins, oxidized phenols. It has a preference for low molecular weight polyphenols. So where gelatin tends to affect high molecular weight tannins, and uh, which is to reduce astringency, uh, PVPP is more for those condensed uh, polyphenols, which is uh, more going to improve uh, or reduce bitterness. It uh, can absorb some of the color and odor from an oxidized mead. Uh, it, it can work at lower temperatures. Uh, and the way that you prepare it is you make up a slurry in warm water and then you stir it. And you should stir it after you add it a few times a day. It still is effective uh, if it hasn't bound to anything. And it settles fairly quickly. So you could rack it as quickly as 24 hours after you add it. Or you could wait a little bit longer. Uh, there are some pr newer products that aren't supposedly, uh, don't supposedly require filtering. But I recommend that no matter what form of PVPP you use that you filter. Uh, and it can work well with activated carbon or with potassium casein. So there's two different uh, types. Uh, there's uh, polyclar 10. Uh, the particles are smaller and require filtering. The polyclar 10 T has a coarser grain. It, it settles better and quicker. Uh, it doesn't fine quite as well, but supposedly does not require filtering. Myself, I recommend filtering uh, both of these types. Any type of PVPP that you use, it would be wise to filter. The polysaccharides. So one of the more popular ones, which I really like also, is sparkloid. It's a proprietary blend of polysaccharides from brown algae uh, with combined with diatomaceous earth. Uh, it does better at the lower end of temperature ranges. It's gentle, does not have much risk of stripping flavor, and it's good for general clarification. Often, if you're not sure what to do, uh, let's say you, you find with bentonite in, in primary and you, you still have some haze afterwards, you're not sure what to use. Often, sparkloid is a wise choice. It can work fairly quickly within a few days up to a few weeks. 
But one of the downsides is it takes it does take a little bit more time to prepare than other agents when you're making the hot mix spark ladies, which is what I recommend. It's not that big of a deal, but it is something that you need to be watching out for or, or need to take a little bit more time to do. And then you need to watch out that you don't like boil the it down and to where it burns. I don't know how many times I've taken a phone call while I was heating the sparkloid only to smell something burning in the kitchen and it was because I didn't pay attention. Uh, there is it can be used as a cold mix but it's much less effective so i recommend using hot mix uh, and it's good for counterfeiting other agents and it, especially for counterfeiting both bentonite or gelatin for general clarification uh we use about two grams per gallon if you're trying to counterfeit bentonite or make the the bentonite leaves a little bit uh, uh settle a little bit tighter you might not need to use as much and so some and some recommend adding to boil water and boiling for only five minutes, other up to 20 or even 30 minutes until it's dissolved and smooth and creamy. So read the instructions. What I do is I put it in boiling water for about five minutes and then I turn the heat down so that it's not boiling or really even simmering. It's just on that very hot water. Uh, don't walk away. I've done that more times than I can remember to take a phone call or I got distracted and then it uh, it can do the... the uh, water can boil away very quickly and you can burn and of course at that point you have to throw it out if much of the water has dissolved or um, has evaporated from the heating you can always add some more hot water back before you add it to the mead uh, it should start forming like a gelatin type smooth creamy texture and then you can rack it off the leaves off leaves after two weeks and then good good idea to filter if you have uh, that ability gum arabic so we don't think about gum arabic as much as of as a fining agent as maybe other agents. Uh, it's sometimes used to improve mouth feel, uh, to improve the quality of carbonation. But it is technically a fining agent because it does uh, prevent uh, metal haze from copper and iron. Uh, it can also stabilize uh, the colloids and, and prevent color loss. This can be an advantage, but one of the downsides is if you add gum arabic, before you've completed your fining, it will make any haze that's already there and still there, it can make it stuck and you'll never get rid of it, as I've learned. Uh, it can also make uh, soften astringency and uh, reduce the perception of acidity a little bit as well. Other fining agents. Activated carbon. Uh, this works uh, through absorption, these little nooks and crannies. Basically, it's non-specific. And that's an advantage, but it's also a disadvantage because it takes it can take out a lot of the good things, the things that you don't want to remove. So I think about activated carbon more as a last resort. It's something that if you are thinking that you may have to end up pouring your batch down the drain, you might try this as a last resort. Although I'll be honest, if, if it is something that you're using as a last resort, you're probably not going to make whatever batch it is. It's probably not going to become a, a wonderful batch. You might be able to just help it enough so that it's not undrinkable and maybe you could use it for blending or something like that. It works very quickly. There's two different types of carbon. There's the triple A, which is more for removing off aromas, uh, like uh, some of the sulfides or some of the, um, like ethyl acetate and some of those other things. Whereas the KBB would be more to remove color from, uh, such as browning from oxidation. But it is a non-selective and harsh uh, finding agent. So it really should be the last resort. I've used it a few times but only when there was, I didn't think there was any hope and I would have had to pour it down the drain anyway. You can combine it with any of the other agents that you might use to manage some of these off flavors, such as PVVP. I didn't put potassium caseinate, but that would be an option. Bentonite or sparkaloid. Now, tannins are not usually considered finding agents, but they are very important to allow finding agents to be more effective. We tend to think about them as enhancing, enhancing structural mouthfeel. It does have some antioxidant properties, but it does help other fining agents be more effective, uh, specifically gelatin, although tannins themselves can help improve the clarity of your mead. Uh, if you use too much, you, you can have unwanted bitter, bitterness and astringency. Basically, tannins work by having first a hydrophobic region and basically there's an association followed by binding it allows the tannin to settle uh, as tannin and protein combination to settle out uh, if you have tannins present you don't need to use as much of other finding agents to 
get the clarity and protein stabilization that you would like. This slide shows how you don't need to use as much bentonite, for example, if the wine uh, has been pretreated with tannins. The things you sometimes might see is if you uh, put your meat into a barrel and how it can clear rather quickly, uh, almost amazingly quickly, and that's from the tannins from the barrel. Enologic tannins, you know, you could do a whole talk just simply about tannin additions and how to use them and when to add them. And there's different types of tannins. When I first started out, there was only one kind. It was the tannin that was at our local homebrew shop. But now there's many different choices and they come from many different sources. Uh, some of them are, are fermentation tannins. They're added before fermentation. Others are cellaring tannins added after fermentation, but there is some time allowed for it to age. Or uh, finishing tannins, uh, for the final touch. And again, this top talk today is more about finding agents. I just simply wanted to mention that there's many different types of tannins that you might uh, decide to choose depending on what you're aiming for. And not all of them are simply to improve structure and mouthfeel, but some of them also help protect your mead from oxidation and then also can help uh, clarify your mead as well. Enzymes. Pectic enzymes, we use those to help break down pectin in certain fruits and thereby preventing a haze. Those we tend to use before fermentation. Uh, it can also help with the extraction of color uh, from the fruit. Uh, this has been a winemaking uh, technique uh, for, for many years. It, you might not need to use as much other fining agents such as bentonite if you pre-treat the fruit juice prior to fermentation with pectic enzyme. Uh, it can help improve uh, fil filterability Pectic enzymes are another one of those uh, that do not work as well at low temperatures. They tend to work better at room temperature uh, or warmer. But one of the things you need to keep in mind is don't add the bentonite or carbon at the same time as the pectic enzyme because basically they're, they'll, be, they'll inactivate. Uh, if I'm going to add bentonite to a batch, I typically will add the pectin first, pectic enzyme first, and then I'll wait about 24 hours before I add the bentonite. There are some other enzymes available too. Scottzyme KS, I think of that as standing for kitchen sink. Uh, basically, it's a blend of enzymes for a difficult to clarify mead. I have used it in some batches that I simply couldn't figure out what to do uh, to get it to clarify, and it worked pretty well. But don't use it before you've processed your grapes and fruit, because if you do, it's going to make a bunch of small little particles that will be very difficult to, uh, to remove. Lysozyme is another enzyme that is used to prevent unwanted malolactic fermentation. I've got some, gotten some uh, malolactic fermentations occurring in some of the red piments I had in a barrel, and so lysozyme can help minimize that. Uh, it uh, works by degrading the cell wall of some of the gram-positive bacteria that cause malolactic fermentation, but it does not affect uh, yeast or then some of the other spoilage bacteria, such as Acetobacter, that uh, you need to prevent in other ways, such as preventing oxidation or using a, a appropriate uh, levels of sulfite. Uh, but never use uh, any of these enzymes at the exact same time that bentonite is added, because it's basically going to remove them. These are uh, these then they won't be effective. Copper sulfite. It's another agent that we don't really think about as a fining agent, in that it's not used for clarification. But it's in here because it does help improve some of the off aromas, off characters that we don't want. It works very quickly for addressing hydrogen sulfide. Uh, it takes a little bit longer for lowering mercaptans, but it's not very effective against disulfides. It, you need to treat first with ascorbic acid. The big downside, however, is that it's potentially toxic. And if you're a commercial meter, there are, are legal limits um, for how much is allowed in your final product. And you'd have to send it to a uh, a wine laboratory to measure that to confirm that it's lower than the legal limit. I know some of the older wineries used to have copper pipes, and sometimes if you look online, people are putting their their mead with you know stirring with a copper spoon or, or putting it through with these little uh, um, scrubbing brushes made out of copper. And I mean, sure that works, but I guess what I worry about is you're putting a potentially toxic metal into your mead uh, that you really have no idea what's getting put in there. Uh, if you use it before fermentation, much of it will be absorbed by the yeast. And if the level of copper is too high, you can decrease that by fining with casein and yeast hulls. But this is not something that I've, I've ever personally used in any of my batches. And I, I would really hesitate for you to use it as a home brewer. I mean, unless you're going to take the time to basically measure it to make sure that the levels are not too high. One product that I do really like is Regulus. It's a proprietary formula formulation from Scott Labs. And it's a 
formulation of inactivated yeast, which is naturally high in copper. So it can do many of the things that copper sulfate will do, reduce some of the sulfide flaws, uh, but it does not have the high risk of adding excess copper to your batch as does copper sulfate. Um, it might also have some mouthfeel uh, benefits as well. Uh, we still recommend bench trials. We d dissolve it in water and then mix well, leave it for a, a few days, no more than a week, and then rack it off the lees. I have used Regulus myself and I, I really like it. And I like the fact that it's a lot safer than uh, using the other techniques that are using copper itself. Problems with fining. Sometimes not everything goes according so what are the factors that can affect fining? There's some fact, fining agent factors themselves, which fining agent you used, uh, how did you prepare that fining agent, how well did you mix that fining agent into the mead, did you just pour it in and walk away, or did you stir it so that it got into good contact with the mead, um, what was the concentration, how much of it did you use, um, and then are there any other, did you use any other fining agents before uh, that? The conditions of your mead also can affect it. Dissolved CO2, lower is better. If there's high dissolved CO2, and this does not necessarily have to be a carbonated mead, it simply could have a lot of CO2. Um, that can minimize the effectiveness of a fining agent. And this is a situation where if you're not going to be patient and you're not going to wait, you may want to degas your mead to try to lower the dissolved CO2 levels. pH certainly can affect it. These fining agents have different isoelectric points, but in general, uh, they, they tend to work better when the pH is lower. Temperature also is an important factor. Uh, many agents do better uh, at a lower end, a lower temperature. Exceptions include bentonite and then the pectic enzyme. These tend to do better at room temperature or slightly warmer. Uh, if there's any of the metal haze that can affect it or if there's any naturally occurring protective colloids or if you made the mistake of adding gum arabic like I've done when it, there was still haze present, you're never going to get rid of that or almost never. Some of the concerns that you could have while fining, if you overfined and didn't measure, certain fining agents can reduce the color by too much or tannins by too much. You can have excessive fluffy leaves, which can result in you uh, losing too much of your product uh, when you're racking. Uh, and this, and there, if, if you overfine, you can also potentially have negative effects on quality. Here's a really nice chart from uh, from Zocline that I, I think is very useful and I'm not going to read through every one of these but you can look at it and it's available in the PDF copy of this uh, presentation. Um, as you can see there are certain finding agents that have a higher risk of reduction of color such as carbon and gelatin. Uh, some agents will have a, a higher volume of lees such as bentonite uh, and then some of them might have a higher potential for overfining as compared to other agents. Uh, this, so this is a spectrum so you, you might want to choose your agent wisely depending on what you're trying to do and you might also be very careful to avoid giving uh, too much. With finding agents uh, you certainly can get too much of a good thing so less is more. You, you really should try to use as little as possible whatever it takes to take to get the job done. So how to avoid problems when finding? Well first choose the finding agent based on the problem that you're trying to address. I know there's a lot of newer mead makers that just so they try this one and it didn't work so they just try this one and they're just randomly going through different finding agents and it makes sense to try to choose the agent dependent uh, based on what problem you're trying to address um, make sure that the conditions are optimal for the finding agent that you've chosen to use uh, the finding agent may have been effective but because the ph is too high and there's too much dissolved co2 turns out that it didn't work as well as it could have Prepare and add your finding agents uh, according to the manufacturer's recommendations and mix well into your batch so that it can, uh, all, all of the finding agent can come in contact with whatever is causing the problem. Dose it according to the manufacturer's recommendations, but when in doubt, always use a lower rather than higher dose. You know, the way I feel about it is you can always add more. You can always refine, you can add another finding agent, or you can add more of the same finding agent. But if you've overfined, you can't take it out after you've added it. Consider two-step or counter finding, more than one agent. I do this quite frequently. I almost always use at least two finding agents. Uh, once in a while, I'm very lucky, and I'll have a, one single agent is enough, and, uh, and I can get away with that. And I can't stress this enough. When in doubt, perform bench trials. 
most of us after a while get pretty comfortable with two or three different finding agents and that's what we use probably 95 percent of the time but there's always going to be a batch that doesn't seem to respond the way that you expected it to and in that situation uh before using a a third agent uh after your first two didn't work you, you might want to do bench trials so that you can figure out exactly what is going to work and then also find out how much of it that you're going to need to add so how to perform bench trial why perform bench trials in the first place? Well, first you want to confirm efficacy. What I mean is you want to make sure that finding agent that you've decided that you're going to use is actually going to work. Uh, you don't want to use something that's not going to, going to work or maybe even cause problems. It, bench trials are helpful to determine the optimal dose. You want to use just enough to accomplish the task, but no more. And also to avoid overfining. Uh, certain agents, I mentioned gelatin being one of them, uh, and there's other ones, you can overfine and it can cause negative uh, effects upon the mead. Uh, if you didn't use too much, you don't have that problem. So it's always better to try to figure out what is the lowest dose that's going to accomplish what you're trying to do. And if it didn't seem to work out, you can always add more later. But if you've added too much, then there's not much you can do to take it out. So how to perform bench trials? Uh, there's laboratory glass where you can get like a graduated cylinder, uh, 1 ml uh, or 5 ml pipette. Another really simple way is just get a syringe and one drop equals 0 0.5 uh, milliliters. Be very accurate in your solution. Obviously, if you didn't make the solution for testing accurately, that could affect uh, what your bench trial tells you. Make sure the solution is well mixed. That the uh, the the, the um, environment uh, you know the characteristics like the dissolved co2 temperature etc is going to be the same in your test batch as as within your actual main batch and you can make up different types of solutions some people use a 10 percent stock solution some people use a 2.5 percent uh, it's easy to make a 10 percent solution it's 10 grams of whatever your finding agent is added to 100 mls of distilled or deionized water uh, and you basically Add it, mix it up, and then add, fill it up with the uh, uh, distilled or deionized water. There, Scott Labs has wonderful documents on how to set up your uh, your bench trial and how many uh, mLs added to say 100 mL will give you a 70, you know, 0 0.07 uh, grams per liter uh, dose or 70 parts per million. Uh, that would be the same as if you put in 0 0.07 uh, mLs of a 10% solution into that. 100 ml uh, sample. Determining clarity. Now, this was one thing I, when I first started out doing, even doing bench trials, I thought, oh, that looks pretty good. And it turned out it really didn't have as much of an effect. And so I really encourage you to get test tubes. And this is kind of fun. It's, you know, you're getting to do a little bit of science. Uh, there are commercially available uh, meters to test turbidity, but for home mead makers like myself or, or for people that are commercial but on a budget which is most everyone uh, you might not be able to get such fancy equipment so another way is to just shine a pen light or a laser pen uh, to through the test tube and you want it to where you don't see any uh, cylinder of haziness you you see the circle of light on either side of the test tube but you don't actually see any here's an example of a uh, bench trial i did showing you the mead before finding and then showing the next test tube next to it uh, after I had added the selective so the, the finding agent that I ultimately selected for clarifying that batch. And this was with silicosol and chitosan or, or super clear. It looks pretty clear. It's hard to see in the photo, but you can see that there's actually a, a slight haze uh, in there. Uh, it's not a completely clear. There's actually that that cone of light or that cone of that or that that cylinder of, of light or haze within that here though you only see the glowing uh, light on either side of the glass of the test tube but it's it's clear inside and this was sparkloid so that's what I decided to use for that problem batch I decided to, to pick sparkloid to counterfine and it worked really very well another way of assessing protein stability uh, to 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 determine whether the mead is at risk of developing a sediment later or perhaps a protein haze later on after it's even months later after it's been in the bottle is to do the hot water batter test. 
Uh, you could, there's many different ways of doing it. You can bring the heat up to uh, over 170 degrees and keep them in that hot water bath for an hour. I know other people who just simply get a, an old crock pot they're not using and they put their samples in that and they put it in there for a few hours. Uh, you remove them and you let them cool to room temperature. And then you look at the samples for haze and clarity. Basically what's happening is the heat exposure denatures the proteins. It's kind of like when you boil an egg, the, the, the egg white is clear and then it turns white. So it denatures those proteins that might be in the meat that you can't see with the naked eye. And then they precipitate out of suspension during the cooling process. And you'll see that sediment at the bottom. And you'll know that before you uh, finish making your batch, before this batch is bottled, you probably need to consider uh, using a fining agent to fix that. And uh, it might be bentonite, for example. Even if you use bentonite before, uh, or, or before fermentation, you might need to add some more bentonite and, and fine it again. And then the beauty of this is you can always go back and do the heat stability test again after you've used your, your finding agent uh, to see if it even works. Or you could even do it after you do a bench trial, like use the finding agent in a small amount, uh, small enough so that you would have a sample to do a hot water bath test. And then once you figure that out, then you can use the finding agent in your main batch to take care of this. As a home brewer, it might not be that big of a deal if there's a little bit of sediment in the bottle later on, but if you're commercial, you know, you don't want it to be on the shelf in a wine shop or a liquor store and the bottles were clear when they got there, but now there's a sediment in the bottle in the bottom of the bottles after it's been there for a few months. An alternative to the heat stability test is the ethanol assay method. Basically, you're mixing it uh, half and half with uh, ethanol, uh, such as Everclear, and it'll precipitate immediately. So this could be pectin or it could be any other proteins that are in there. It doesn't tell you exactly what the, the problem is, but at least gives you a clue that there is some uh, uh, protein in there that uh, means that your your mead or wine is unstable and you, you better do something about it before you bottle it because you don't want to end up with this in the bottle later on. There are also bench trials for diagnosing what type of sulfides you have. Uh, this is a really good technique through uh, Santa Rosa um, a wine making. A, there, there's a nice uh, presentation about this. Uh, basically, you have three glasses, three samples. One is a control, so you have something to compare it to. Another one is with a 0.05% solution of copper sulfate, which will remove uh, monomercaptans and hydrogen sulfate. And then a third glass, which you've added a solution of ascorbic acid or vitamin C. You wait a few minutes, and then you add your copper sulfate, which will also remove the uh, dimethyl sulfides. Now, it's important, you know, you did add a high amount of copper, so don't drink it. Do not drink it. Don't drink it by accident. But it basically, you determine based on smell. And so if there's no change in smell, um, you know, at all, in, in, then it's not a, a sulfide problem. Uh, if there is a reduction or elimination of smell in the ascorbic acid and copper sulfate solution, but not in the copper sulfate only solution, then that's going to be disulfide problem, and you'll know what you need to do to eliminate that. Uh, if there's a reduction of smell or elimination of smell uh, in both glass 2 and glass 3, then you probably have uh, mercaptans, di perhaps disulfides, and then hydrogen sulfate. But at least you'll have an idea of what you might need to do to address uh, it if you have a mead that seems kind of stinky, but you're not exactly sure what type of sulfite it is or what you should do about it. And again, don't drink these or even by accident. It's very important to, to not do that. There are finding tr uh, trial calculators. I mentioned Scott Labs has some charts so that you can figure out how to do your bench trial. And here's some other ways to set it up. Uh, uh, the Australian uh, Wine Research Institute has this freely available. So to summarize my presentation about finding agents, think about them more than only for clarification. And to be sure, most of the time, 90-95% of the time, we're using finding agents. We're trying to reduce and prevent haze. Uh, but there are other things that finding agents can be useful for to improve the characteristics of your mead. Uh, choose your finding agent based on the problem you're trying to address. It makes sense to use the right tool to fix the problem. Uh, make sure that the conditions are optimal for your finding agent, uh, specifically low dissolved carbon dioxide, lower pH is better, and then make sure it's at the optimum temperature for that mead. Prepare and add those finding agents according to the manufacturer's recommendation and mix well when you add them to the mead. Uh, dose it appropriately. When in doubt, use a lower dose than higher. Consider counterfining with more than one agent. And finally, when you're unsure or when you have a problem batch, always think about performing bench trials. 
So here are some of the references that I used if you want to read more. Uh, don't take my word for anything I say. I recommend going and, and reading and learning for yourself. All uh, available and printed in the PDF uh, handout of this presentation. And I encourage you to uh, print it out and use it as a reference to help you make better memes. This concludes our video on finding agents. I hope that you find the information helpful. If you do, please consider following us on YouTube. Thank you for watching. Cheers and good luck making the most delicious mead possible.